States Marine Band, from then to now. And here is the leader of the United States Marine Band, Colonel William F. Sattleman. How do you do, friends of the United States Marine Band? You know, so many of you have indicated an interest in the history of the Marine Band that we've decided to show you something about what the Marine Band looked like and sounded like in its early days. You know, we were formed by Act of Congress in 1798. And of course, the Marine Band didn't look and sound then like it does today. So to begin with, we're going to show you what the Marine Band looked like and sounded like uh, probably back in 1798 when we first played Yankee Doodle, probably the oldest military song we have in this country. Now to do that, we're going to have three members of the Marine Band, a drummer and two fifers, who are going to use instruments that were obtained from the Dayton C. Miller Collection at the Library of Congress here in Washington, and they're going to play Yankee Doodle as it was first heard in this country. Modern instruments benefiting from modern science produce much better intonation and tonal quality than the ancient uh, fights that you just heard. Now to demonstrate that, we're going to ask our uh, Marines of 1798 to lay down the fights and pick up the piccolos of today and play Yankee Doodle in its modern version and I'm sure you'll see a great improvement. you'll all agree with me that modern instruments make music sound a great deal better than those made 150 years ago. I think we said a little while ago that we were formed in 1798 by a special act of Congress. Well, of course, we were formed in the city of Philadelphia, but we didn't remain there very long because in 1800, when the federal government moved from Philadelphia to Washington, the Marine Band moved here with it. Well, we camped on a hill overlooking the historic Potomac River, and we began giving concerts almost immediately. Well, of course, there was no other amusement in the new city, so all the people of the city came to our camp to hear this music. And among those who came was a man by the name of John Adams. You see, he had just moved into a new building called the President's House, and it was just about a half a mile from our camp. Well, he enjoyed the music very much, in fact, so much so, that on New Year's Day, 1801, the first time that he opened the door to the White House for the citizens of the city to come in, he invited the Marine Band to provide the music for that occasion and we have provided the music for every occasion since that time. And of course, music in those days, like it is today, is based pretty much on the popular type of music. But it wasn't the foxtrot or the samba or the rumba those days, it was the minuet. So we're going to play a minuet for you now, one that we feel quite sure was popular in the early days of our country and was undoubtedly danced to in the famous East Room of the White House. We're going to play for you now with the instrumentation of about 1801, the Boccherini Minuet. Thank you. 
That was the Baccarini Minuet, as it must have sounded, played by the Marine Band in the White House for the early dances in around 1801. Well, now, you've just recently seen the Marine Band take part in a great inauguration, and we began our inaugural duty back in about 1801 for the inauguration of Thomas Jefferson. Eight years later, when his successor, James Madison, took over office, we again played for the inauguration, and then after the inauguration, we played for the first inaugural ball. On that occasion, we played marches that were written for and dedicated to the retiring president and to the new incumbent of the office. We're going to play one of them for you now, but we're I want to show you, first of all, a manuscript of the Jefferson, of the Madison march that was played on the same occasion. If you can look here, you'll see that it was composed by a citizen of the city of Washington and dedicated to his pupils. And then underneath it, it says, this is the march that the president and his lady were serenaded with by the city band, that's the way the Marine Band was known as in those days, the 4th of March, 1809, the day of his inauguration. Now we're going to play the Jefferson March for you. That was the Thomas Jefferson March that the Marine Band played for the first inaugural ball. As you notice, the bass instrument of that group was the bassoon. But undoubtedly, another bass instrument that the Marine Band used in those days was the instrument that I hold here. Queer looking thing, isn't it? But you see, this bears the title of a serpent or serpentine. Strangely enough, it's made of wood, covered with leather, wrapped, I should say, with leather, and it produces a very deep tone. Originally, it was called the base of the bugle family because you used brass mouthpieces, you see, and uh, undoubtedly it fit in very well with the instruments of the lower register. Of course, we couldn't use this very acceptably, and soon it was followed by another instrument known as the Ophoclide. This is the instrument that followed the serpent. And as I said, it's called the Ophoclide. Now, this was probably the first of the bass brass instruments used by the Marine Band. Strangely enough, it has the key system that was probably used by the clarinets of those days, and certainly the forerunner of the key system of the modern saxophone. However, it was played with a mouthpiece that was used by the rest of the brass family. I rather think that this was the forerunner of the big sousaphone that we use today. Incidentally, of course, this instrument has long since become obsolete, because it was not mechanically the fine instrument that we wanted, but it did give the bass to the brass section of the band. Another instrument that was used at about the same time was known as the cornopian. That was an instrument that was the forerunner of the modern cornet. Incidentally, I want to tell you about this uniform that this man wears. This is the way the marine bandsmen looked probably around the year 1840. I believe we probably caused just as much of a, a sensation with this uniform as the Marines, of course, today, do today in their blue uniform. This instrument that I hold here, as I said, is the forerunner of the modern cornet. I know a lot of you are going to ask, well, how in the world do they ever operate with only two vowels? Because we use three and four today. Well, the secret is this. The first vowel merely lowered or raised the tone a half tone. And then this one would raise or lower the tone a full tone. Together, they changed the pitch a minor third, and in that way they were able to play almost the full chromatic scale. However, it was the first instrument to be made in this general shape, and of course was the forerunner of the modern cornet. Now to demonstrate these instruments, we're going to play a composition uh, written by one of America's foremost uh, early composers, Louis Gutschalk of New Orleans. The composition bears the unique title of Pasquinade.
there you saw and heard some very interesting instruments, but rather impractical ones. And because the fact that they could not answer the test of time, they soon became obsolete. But shortly after they were used, the Marine Band was given a new type of instrument, one that I think had a particular utility and was perhaps very good even for today's use. They were known as over-the-shoulder instruments, and I have one here that I'd like to show you before the band plays on them. You see, this is a cornet and was played in somewhat of this fashion. Now, as you can see, the band might be marching forward, but the sound would come out of the bell, going over their shoulder and going to the rear. That was a great help to any marching unit that might be marching with them. And I know that even today, sometimes when we march on parades, our troops wish that we still had over-the-shoulder instruments. Now, these were made in all of the various voices. This happens to be a cornet but they were made in a similar pattern all the way down through the scale until we came to the bass tubas. Now we're going to play Rally Round the Flag Boys to let you see how it sounds to come out over the shoulder. Rally around the flag, boy, or the battle cry of freedom, whichever you'd like to call it. Still a grand patriotic tune and one that we've had the pleasure of playing many times for our old veterans. Now, following the era of the over-the-shoulder instrument, we came to another group of instruments that still have their influence on the instruments of today. They were the upright instruments, such as I hold here. Now, this is an alto, but they were also made in the baritone, tenors, and the basses. They were all upright instruments except the cornet. Now, even today, our tubas and our baritones and euphoniums are still built in this gentle pattern. So you see that the influence is still that we, one we still keep. To demonstrate these instruments, we're going to have one of our boys play a cornet solo for you. And it's one that was played by the great uh, Patrick Sarsfield Gilmore. Now, I know that that name is familiar to almost every young bandsman anywhere in this country. And I'm going to show you here an instrument that we're going to use for this cornet solo this was the cornet that Patrick Sarsfield Gilmore himself used. It's a beautifully inscribed gold instrument. Uh, and incidentally, I'd like to say that we are greatly indebted to the C.G. Conn Band Instrument Company of Elkhart, Indiana, for allowing us to use it here. It was loaned to us for this occasion. Now, this instrument was probably used by Gilmore, who incidentally came to this country in 1842 from Ireland and turned out to be one of the greatest virtuosi and probably one of the greatest bandmasters and showmen that ever appeared in this country. He remained here until his death in 1892. And to demonstrate this, we're going to play a composition that he wrote and undoubtedly played, probably on this very instrument. It merely bears the title of Barcarolle. And to do this, we're going to ask uh, Sergeant Bramwell Smith if he won't come up here and play this for us. Thank you. I'm sure that Gilmore could not have made his beautiful cornet sound any sweeter than did our Sergeant Bramwell Smith. And now I want to tell you a little story about a former member of the Marine Band. 
It was about 1867 that a member of the Marine Band decided to take his young son down to the Marine Barracks and enlist him in the Marine Band as a music boy. The boy was only a little over 13 years of age, and it was his assignment to learn the art and mysteries of music. Well, evidently, music was not to be too much of a mystery for him, because by 1880, he had progressed to the point where he was appointed the leader of the Marine Band and remained its leader for the next 12 years. The name of that young boy was John Philip Sousa and he was a very illustrious band leader. And in 12 years that he was leader of the Marine Band, he wrote such great marches as Semper Fidelis, the Washington Post, the Thunderer, High School Cadets, and of course a great many others. Now I'm sure that there are many bandsmen in this country that associate his name not only with the great marches that he wrote, but for an instrument that also bears his name, the sousaphone. And we have here today the original sousaphone made by the C.G. Conn Band Instrument Company of Elkhart, Indiana, to whom, incidentally, we are very uh, grateful for the loan of this instrument, which you will ordinarily only see in the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. I think you will notice that in this particular case, the bell of the instrument extends in directly upward rather than forward as the modern sousaphones do today. I also want to call your attention to the uniform that this member of the Marine Band wears. It's our famous full dress uniform, scarlet background, trimmed in black and white. It's one that we know that members of the Marine Band have worn for at least 80 years and possibly a great deal longer than that. And now to let you hear this instrument and to see the members of the Marine Band in this colorful uniform, we of course are going to play a Sousa march. And I know the march that most of you would like us to play will be the Stars and Stripes Forever. That was Sousa music at its very best. Most Americans think of the Marine Band as a concert band. I don't believe that very many of you realize that the Marine Band also performs as a full symphony orchestra. In fact, it's necessary for everyone who joins the Marine Band to be able to double on an instrument that can be used in an orchestra as well as a band. Now, that orchestra was first formed about the turn of the century and was organized by the man whose picture you see on the wall here behind me. This was the first settlement who served in the Marine Band. My father, Captain William H., who was a member of the Marine Band for eight years and leader of the Marine Band for 29 years. It was under his administration that the Marine Band first went to the White House and performed there as an orchestra. And we're going to let you see and hear the orchestra as it would appear at the White House now. To do that, we're going to appear in the special full dress uniform that is worn only there. You'll notice that it is also scarlet in color, but it lacks the gold braid, the uh, white epaulets and aguilettes that you will see in the band full dress uniform. Now the music we're going to play is the music that is customarily played when the president appears. It will start with the 
presidential honors, the four ruffles and flourishes, and then, of course, Hail to the Chief. Now, Hail to the Chief is a song that first became popular in this country about 1812. We don't know when it was first used to announce the arrival of the president, but we do know that in uh, John Philip Sousa's autobiography, he speaks about the fact that in 1880, when he became leader, that the number had been used since time immemorial to announce the arrival of the president. So now we're going to play for you in the White House uniform, the four ruffles and flourishes, and hail to the chief as you would hear them played at the White House for the arrival of the president. Too bad we couldn't have had the President of the United States there personally to complete that scene. But that's the way the Marine Band sounds when it announces the presence of the Chief Executive. I said a little while ago that the Marine Band was formed in 1798, and of course that makes us well over 150 years old. Well, of those 150 odd years, the nation has weathered many a serious conflict, and the Marine Band is always taking its proper place in those conflicts. We have borne arms, we have stood guard, and of course, we have always expressed the spirit of the nation musically. We're going to play next for you a song that perhaps expressed the feeling of a nation more vividly in wartime than any other that we ever had. It's the great over there that was so popular in World War I and which really expressed the spirit of the Yanks as they were going over to France. Now, over there, as the Marine Band customarily plays it. I don't believe that any song has ever expressed the fighting spirit of America as completely as did over there. Now, the scenes that we have shown you today of the Marine Band have been of various sections, small bands, orchestras, and then larger bands. But in each instance, the organization has been in what we call concert formation. Now, the Marine Band, however, is a marching unit as well as a concert unit. In fact, this can be attested to by the fact that the Marine Band has taken part in every inaugural parade since the inauguration of Thomas Jefferson in 1801. I'm sure a lot of you would like to see the Marine Band in that kind of action, so we're going to take you now to the historic Marine Barracks here in Washington, D.C., and let you see what the Marine Band in its colorful full-dress uniform, and in this case augmented by the Drum and Bugle Corps of that post, looks like as they parade down the parade ground at the Marine Barracks.
afraid that's all the time we have now. But I do hope that you've enjoyed being with us and hearing about your Marine Band from then until now. <laughs>